we do so when we um, you know see see shifts in our business and we want to try to understand why um, you know we we try to we look at data as, as one data point and that tells you the what we talk about that knowing you have the what um, but then you need to understand the why what's the why behind the what and sometimes the why you can you can glean some of the why in, in more data and sometimes the why uh, you want to substantiate that with um, more qualitative information, whether it be surveys or focus groups or other, other elements. Um, so we try to look at multiple different ways to, to um, support and substantiate um, what we might be seeing in the data. Hello and welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today, my guest is Elizabeth Price, the Chief Marketing Officer at Anthropology Group. Elizabeth spent a full decade in the beauty industry prior to her work at Anthropology. She's worked at industry leaders and digitally native startups. Prior to that, she led the direct to consumer marketing efforts at J. Crew and Saks Fifth Avenue. Anthropology has long been known for its experiential stores, in addition to its explosive e commerce efforts and incredibly beautifully curated products. Please enjoy this interview with Elizabeth Price. Elizabeth, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. I am so excited to have you here because anthropology has been such a big force in my life from the moment I even walked in there in Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia, which is so inspired by the beauty. So welcome. Well, that's always great to hear. I mean, that's what we look to do every day, inspire people to uh, enjoy our stores, enjoy our website, enjoy our products. That's what we live for every day. Yeah. And you know, I was surprised recently when I was shopping for furniture that you guys don't just sell clothing or jewelry, but you sell quite a bit of furniture. It's shocking. Yeah. I'm glad you actually noticed that. Um, that's been a big, uh, a big effort of ours over the last couple of years, especially. Um, you may know, you may have noticed that we have a dedicated Instagram channel called Anthro Living, um, over 500,000 uh, followers strong. Um, our, our goal is that we know that, as you said it earlier, people love to experience anthropology beyond just the clothes they wear. They want to experience it in, you know, how they live their life. Um, so many people have said, oh, I walk into an anthropology store. I wish my home could be like this. Mm-hmm. Well, now actually that is, um, that is. Uh, closer to truth uh, than it ever has been before, and people really can live uh, like the stores they are they are living in and shopping in. Mm-hmm. And I understand that you hail from the beauty industry, and you're very interested in digital. Can you talk about your approach to when you joined Anthropology to make sure that it continued to push the envelope and be relevant in a world where? You know, e-commerce is exploding. There's been so much change in retail. So, so tell us how you got started um, when you joined Anthropology. Great question. Um, when I first started, uh, it was in December of 2019, and um, uh, I came in with the remit specifically to work on our home business, work on a home strategy. Um, you said it perfectly. We have wonderful product, um, and we had. We had items that people were clamoring for, but we weren't really telling those stories and we weren't really showing um, showing all of that to our customers in the way that we could have. So um, so our first step was put together put together a strategy to actually grow our home business, um, starting with the customers we needed, the customers we were going to go after. Um, how do we make sure we get in front of them? What are the channels we need to be, get, be using to get in front of them? Uh, and that pointed a lot to uh, focusing on some of our bigger furniture. Um, making sure that people knew about the quality of our furniture, the uniqueness of our furniture, um, and the styles and, and and the products that we deliver, and then making sure that we were featuring that uh, furniture in the channels where people actually go uh, to find out about uh, new furniture purchases, like Pinterest, like Instagram, like uh, the social channels that that people use to start putting together their pin board and their, their mood board for their homes. Speaking of mood, when you walk by an anthropology, you're definitely transported, even just through the windows and the art in the windows and the smells when you walk into the store. Um, Can you talk about how the experiential piece of anthropology has changed in the last few years? Yeah, 
Absolutely. Well, I, I am, you know, the windows are our pride and joy. I, I think that um, they are truly uh, the window, the transportation to, to a different world when you walk into anthropology. So many times we hear in focus groups, we hear in surveys, you know, how did you first, you know, start shopping in anthropology? And oftentimes as I was walking by the store and I, and I couldn't keep myself from walking in. Um, so we, we look at the window as just another articulation of the creativity that we believe in so, so strongly. Um, we, we truly are, um, you know, a creativity led brand, um, that is heart and soul of what we're all about. Uh, I think in this day and age, so many companies are trying to be data led. And I think that, um, I think that there's a risk there, frankly. Um, I think data by definition is only historical and only what's happened. And I think that, um, creativity is what drives the inspiration and creativity is what drives aspiration and, and interest in the future. And so we, we try very hard to keep the creativity, um, you know, front and center in terms of what we do. I don't know if you had a chance to go by our holiday windows last year, but, you know, our whole theme was all aglow. And, and from everything from the windows to the merchandise inside the store to the candles that were selected to the imagery to the font to the, to the catalog, it was all about all aglow. Um, and and the, the consistency of that message um, is, is what's special and what, what, what keeps people um, excited about coming, coming to it and coming back to it. So our viewers and listeners of this podcast, a lot of them work in customer experience, but that can mean different things to different people. What fascinates me about customer experience is it's different within every single company. So would you share with us, Elizabeth, how customer experience customer experience is led at your company? Is it your team? If so, what does your team look like? And we can start there. Yeah, I think that oh, first and foremost, I would say that everyone in the whole organization is is challenged to think about the customer. So this is not a um, this is not a department or a function um, that is uh, anyone's um, sole so it, customer service and customer care doesn't sit just with one function. We're all thinking about it um, when when letters come and are written to the company. You know those are those are treated as they should be with great care and. Um, and we're all on deck to make sure that we're sorting out customer problems. Um, I, I wish just I wish I could say that we never have any problems, but that's that's not realistic. And there's always there's always problems. And I think the last two years have taught us, if nothing else, to to recognize that problems arise. Problems sometimes are outside of our control, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still try to solve it for the customer uh, in a way that is, um, is is thoughtful and respectful. Elizabeth, I would love to know, since you mentioned it in the last two years, were there any lessons learned from a time where everybody was forced to reimagine what customer experience looked like? Yeah, um, great question. I, I think that one thing that we learned is that, um, and this may sound obvious, but you, you, need to be, um, you need to be humble and you need to be honest with the customer. And I think that, um, you know, the reality is with, with COVID is one thing from, from the, from the, um, from the, you know, the, the disease portion of it, if you will. But then the other parts of COVID were the supply chain and the labor shortage and so many other elements that, that also came from, that were an upshot of, of uh, what happened starting in March of 2020. And I think that what, what that's taught us is that the more transparent we can be with our customer, the more transparent we can be with our community. Um, customers, soon to be customers, um, uh, our vendors, our partners, that's what it's all about because um, we're all navigating so many unknowns that the more transparent we can be. Um, and that, that means sometimes taking a risk and, and telling customers uh, what we thought was going to be an April delivery might be a May delivery now. Um, we thought it would be here in time, but we're just learning this ourselves. And some customers may may not be happy with that. We understand that. That's their that's their choice uh, if they want to keep uh, keep keep the product on order or not. But we we owe it to them to be at least transparent with the information we have at hand. And I think that ultimately you end up earning a lot of goodwill with the customer over time. I'm so glad to hear you use the language of the customer. I would be interested to know how you would describe your own CMO leadership strategy. Oh, um, my leadership strategy. Um, 
you know, I think leadership is is really about one setting clear direction with the team so that everyone's clear about what the priorities are. I think secondly, it's um, making sure the team feels supported to achieve the very best they can do. Um, and 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 third, thirdly is or or, or next would be um, making sure that you're you're providing the tools, whether it be uh, more, more, more skills they need to be working on or, or guidance or, or access or breaking down barriers along the way for them to actually um, see for themselves just how, how far they can, they can uh, take their own, uh, their own skills and their own experiences. So Elizabeth, this podcast is all about customer experience. It's what we live and breathe every day. You did mention that you try not to get too inundated with data and you really try and just make sure that you're seeing the experience from all sides, not just having your head down in the data, but I'm sure you are looking at customer data of some kind. Would you be willing to share with our listeners what customer data you are looking at? Yeah. Um, Sure. I, I mean... Look, every day we're looking at data for sure. Um, I guess, and what I was saying earlier, uh, just to clarify, we don't we we want to be inspired by the data for certain. The data helps us choose uh, which direction to head, um, which avenue to prioritize, um, which uh, which which channel to support and lean into. The data that data is really really important because that effectively is is um, is is building trends. And we want to make sure that we're leading into those trends, good and good or bad, and, and when we pivot if they're bad. Um, so the data is critically important. Um, just just to clarify, the we we don't want to only be looking at data though, because then that would limit uh, the creativity that is that is heart and soul of this brand, and and that is sort of propels the customer to be inspired for our future. Having said that, though, the data we look at is the data that a lot of companies look at. Um, and I think the data point itself is less important than the trending of that data. So is that data set going, is, is your trending going up or down in net promoter score? Is your data going up or down in your customer count? Um, is your data going up and down in the, um, the specific categories within your customer count? You know, home categories versus apparel categories versus um, accessories categories, et cetera. So, so we look at all of those pretty, pretty intently. Um, category data, customer data, where we're capturing new customers, how we're capturing new customers, which channels are, are leading us to new customers. Those are all data points that we look at on a regular basis to, to inform our strategies going forward. What would you say, Elizabeth, makes you an incredible marketer? You've moved up in your career. It's very hard to make it to become CMO of one of the most coveted retailers in the world. What is your secret sauce of being a marketer? Oh, gosh. Um, well, um, thank you for the compliment. First, I'll say that. That's very kind of you. Uh, I would say that um, you have to always keep learning. Like, especially in marketing, you have to always be curious about what you don't know and try to learn it. Um, I think that is uh, actually an element that we, we take of high value within the organization is curiosity. Um, and, and having the confidence to know when you don't know something, um, to then ask your partners, uh, ask other people in the industry, um, ask experts uh, the things you don't know, so you can get better at that. Um, I would also say that um, I, I think that whatever industry, whatever function, whatever whatever role you play, I think the people who end up being successful in those roles have a couple of qualities that I think are pretty consistent. One is um, strong communication style um, and, and able to, to not just communicate clearly, um, but actually galvanize. And I think that is actually a quality that um, I look for a lot in my leaders. Can they not just have the information and, and be people I can count on for the correct information, but can they actually motivate, influence, and galvanize their teams and, and cross-function of the organization to move forward in a direction that that might be something different from what they've used to be doing. Uh, so I think those are those are all qualities that I think are are important in any leader for that matter. When you say that, it makes me think of the phrase change management. If you can galvanize people, if you can get them to go in a direction that they hadn't anticipated, 
you're a great change manager. Is that sort of what you're getting to is the change management piece of leadership? Um, I, I think it's change management, but I think it's it's uh, change management often assumes that there's something that needs to be changed too. I think the I think that is sometimes the case, but I think the other part is is actually um, is actually um, taking something that's working and exploding it. Like you know, like your example of of the mirror. Like if it's the mirror, I think it is that you that you recently bought then that is a great example of something that was a, a, a product in our assortment and, and people loved this, this product and we, we got behind it more in marketing. You know, we, we made sure we talked about it more in our emails. We talked about it more in our social. We made sure it was uh, out there in, in social channels beyond our own. And, and that's a great example because um, that became an item that, that, that you heard about that you wanted, that you wanted to covet for yourself and that you treated yourself to. And I can't wait to see it when it's delivered. I did um, treat myself. Everybody listening, we were talking before the podcast. I was telling Elizabeth, I bought, yes, it is the gleaming primrose mirror. I wanted a huge, beautiful mirror for my fireplace. And it's really hard. If we just moved, it's hard to find the right type of furniture. It's expensive. There's delayed shipping. I bought this mirror and it was so gorgeous. It was exactly what I wanted. It came very quickly. I was really, really happy, and um, everything was great. So I can't believe that anthropology really is curating so many beautiful things. I admit I was really hung up in the art section online just like for hours. <laughs> I felt like it was hours like looking through all of the art. So it seems like you guys aren't just a retailer. A big part of what you do is just curation and even teaching people design and giving them yeah. things they might not even know that they want or need. Yeah. Well, I think everyone wants to feel comfortable in in their home and in their in their in their self and in their body, and and that's what we want to provide. You know, we want to provide that uh, that sense of comfort and that sense of um, you know of of trueness to who they are. You know, when we do focus groups and we hear customers talk about sort of how they discovered anthropology or why they come to anthropology, uh, it's so often because we have unique products they can't find anywhere else, and and by and large, they can't find anywhere else because so much of our product is is, is made for us or or that we design ourselves, um, and that they they want to have uh, and want to live in an environment that is different from everything else they see in those around them because they they see themselves as very unique and they are and we want to make sure that we provide uh, provide that inspiration and, and give them permission to to enjoy that uh, that that uniqueness themselves. Yeah. And that's really the legacy of the brand. And I can remember even as a teenager driving to Newport beach to fashion Island. And I remember there were like, I had like maybe one beautiful shirt that I bought and it was very expensive for me. I think it was over a hundred dollars. I probably saved up my money. I still remember it. It was a cream. It had little pleated sleeves. It was very light. It had a beautiful floral design and it kind of cinched in a bit at the waist. And I had that jacket for years and it was literally like my favorite jacket because it meant something to me. It wasn't just a jacket. <laughs> like yeah. it, it made me feel amazing when I wore it. Well, I think what you're touching on is something that we talk about a lot also, which is how do we um, be there with our customer during these magic moments? So in your example, you can still remember that first purchase you ever made in anthropology. And there, if there's, if we had a nickel for every type of story we've heard, we would all, that's just like that. They remember their first time they made a purchase. They remember coveting something so much they saved up for it. And that for us is so special. It, it means that they trusted us enough to actually uh, part with their, their hard earned or hard saved money for something that's going to mean something to them, mean something beyond just the clothes on their back or, um, their 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 handbag in their uh, you know on on their in their closet, and and that is very meaningful. So we think a lot about how do we be part of those magic moments in someone's life, both those big magic moments like weddings with our wedding collection like Beholden, or a new home, or a first apartment, um, or or you know designing designing and, and redecorating uh, a new home. Those are all magic moments. But then we take it down one step further, which is. How about those private times that are that are magic in their own right? Sunday morning breakfast with the kids, or um, you know, 
uh, New Year's Eve night, uh, making a nice dinner with your with your special friends. Those are also magic moments that may not be milestone moments in one's life, but they're still moments that anthropology can can play a part of. And and we we take that we take that role very seriously. So you started, you said, I think December 2019, a few months before the pandemic changed all of our lives. I'm curious if you saw a big shift while in your time there from more of a retail focus to more of an e-commerce digital focus, and if that shift continues to happen. So uh, very good question. I would say that we, um, I mean, the whole world shifted pretty quickly in in uh, in focusing on e-commerce because we had to. Um, I, will, I will say that anthropology was, and all of the urban brands for that matter, were in a much, uh, which in a much better state at that point than a lot of other companies may have been because we always have had a very strong um, technology support and we've always had very strong um, uh, web, web businesses. So I would say that we had something to start with. I think a company um, that did not have any of that in place prior to the pandemic, uh, starting in March of 2020, would definitely have had a harder time ramping up those efforts um, and then learning those learning those techniques and then building their business uh, literally from the ground up uh, as the pandemic was was coming on uh, onto the scene. So we had something to work with, and we also had even more importantly, we had a very loyal customer base. So we had two important things already um, in our in our toolkit, if you will. And then the, the question was, how do we now connect with our customers differently than what we would have before? Um, we would have connected with them a lot in the stores. And while that's still, uh, while, while people still love the stores, how do we still share um, a little bit of that excitement uh, in a virtual environment? Mm -hmm. I guess we, we, changed, we changed sort of our marketing mix. We changed our strategy in, the, in that standpoint, not unlike every other company out there. I think the, the things that we learned from that is what can we do differently? Um, how can we work differently? And in some cases, you know, are the things we're doing now even better? I'll give you one great example. You know, we were forced to actually think about focus groups um, in the non in the non um, live sense. We had to think about focus groups in a virtual sense, and and that actually served to be pretty efficient for us. Um, we were able to get uh, more focus groups out in a in a pretty quick timeline, and just learn from our customers um, and hear from them um, uh, one on one. Uh, on what they're what they're thinking and what and, and how they're how they're approaching uh, their purchasing behaviors going forward. Mm -hmm. You keep talking about focus groups. It seems like that is a really big part of your marketing strategy. Do you sit in on no. quite a few focus groups over the no, year? No, you're you're just catching me because we had some last week. Okay, <laughs> so it's sort of like top of top of mind. Um, we do we do we do do happen to our customers. We we do so when. Um, uh, we do so when we, um, you know, see see shifts in our business, and we want to try to understand why. Um, you know, we we try to we look at data as as one data point, and that tells you the what. We talk about that knowing you have the what, um, but then you need to understand the why. What's the why behind the what? And sometimes the why you can you can glean some of the why in in more data, and sometimes the why. Uh, you want to substantiate that with um, more qualitative information, whether it be surveys or focus groups or other other elements. Um, so we try to look at multiple different ways to to um, support and substantiate um, what we might be seeing in the data. The last question before we get into rapid fire round, Elizabeth, is: Do you love what you do, and if you love it, why do you love it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I I. I think I have the best job in the whole world. I mean, this is a, a brand that people love, customers who we love. Um, we provide a, a smile to so many people every day. Um, we provide the smiles um, when people come into our stores. We provide the smiles um, when they get a package at home delivered to them. Like we, we, we have the privilege of making people feel better about themselves and their lives. And that is a privilege we take very seriously, and and we're very responsible. We we take that, we take we, that's that's a very big um, that's a very big responsibility of ours. So it is it's a fantastic it's a fantastic um, company. It's a fantastic role. It's a fantastic brand, and I'm lucky enough to be part of it. And and I I'm thrilled. 
I love that. And it's so nice to hear the gratitude that you're so grateful for your customers. Let's end with the rapid fire round. I'm going to ask you a couple questions before I let you go. And I just want you to say the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready, Elizabeth? Okay. I'll be as ready as I can be. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. What is one tool that you used for personal growth and development during COVID? Uh, one tool, always ask for feedback. Okay. Um, if we you say, could we say that feedback is a gift. If people care enough to give you feedback, that's a good thing. That's a, yeah, that's a really brave apo- approach. The scary thing about feedback is anybody could say anything, and that's scary. Um, you're stuck on an island. You have water, but you can bring one other food and one other drink. What are they? Oh, food. Uh, I have to say Maryland crab cakes because I'm from Maryland. Um, okay. And drink, I would say a nice cold beer. Okay. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, I'd like to have lunch with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yep. Yep. She's awesome. Or she was awesome. May she rest in peace. Who is the best band of all time? Oh, you've stopped me here. I, I do not know bands. Or what kind of music oh, do you Oh, well, love? see, I, was, I studied classical piano for years. So oh, I would yeah. like to say I'd like to meet Johann Sebastian Bach. So I can say that. Amazing. Okay. What is your most embarrassing work moment? Oh, embarrassing work moment. I was giving a major presentation um, to the CEO of Macy's and the CEO of um, SU Lauder Companies. And in the middle of the presentation, in the middle of my presentation, the system went down. There was tech difficulties throughout. And I had to basically wing the rest of my presentation. So that was my most embarrassing, but it also... um, it taught me that I have to I have to know the data so well I can't rely on anything else but my own brain, and um, and you can never be more you can never be too prepared. That is the big learning learning from that one. You can never be too prepared. I love that. I think that's so powerful. Well, Elizabeth, I want to thank you so much for being on the Modern Customer Podcast. If people want to learn more about anthropology or you, where can they where can they visit to learn more? Well, certainly you can visit the website anthropology.com. Um, we also have uh, a LinkedIn page. Um, so I invite you to, and we also have uh, an Urban an Urban Inc. Uh, company uh, webpage too. So I invite you to check out any of the three. And the Instagram, right? Oh, absolutely. We have an Instagram uh, at Anthro Living for the living and at Anthropology. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me. All of you have been listening and watching the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. Please subscribe and don't forget to check out my new community at customerexperiencecommunity.com. Join your peers, get access to incredible resources and become a founding member. See you there.